Hello, everybody. Welcome at the uh, Warsaw Colloquium for uh, Theoretical uh, Physics. This month, we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Philippe Grangier from uh, the Institute of Optics of uh, French National uh, Research Center and uh, University of Paris. Mm -hmm. Professor Grangier is the head uh, of the uh, optics group there. Uh, his uh, research, uh, he, he has made quite a significant breakthrough in quantum optics throughout his career. Uh, his uh, main speciality, so to say, are the non-classical uh, states of uh, light and generation of uh, non-classical states, uh, states of light. Also, um, atom-photon interactions, uh, which then evolved uh, into quantum technologies, namely in quantum cryptography, or more uh, uh, in a more specialized language into co uh, continuous variable quantum key distribution. But Apart from all these uh, achievements, he is probably most famous for uh, uh, his uh, work together with uh, uh, Alain Aspe and, uh, and the collaborators on the first uh, experimental violation of Bell inequality, which was performed in, in France between 80, 1980 and 1982, exactly. There were famous uh, three papers. You co-authored two of them. Right. as far as I remember, uh, together with uh, Alain Aspect mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, Jean Dalibard, Jean Dalibard and, and, uh, Gérard and this engineer, I forgot, <laughs> Gérard Roger. Uh, okay, so today we will, we will hear, uh, I'm sure, a fascinating talk on, on, on the experimental, uh, experimental side of this uh, groundbreaking uh, achievement for which, as you might know, two years ago there was a Nobel Prize awarded to, to Alain Aspe and uh, Professor Grangier will, will show us uh, a bit of uh, how it all happened back then. Philippe, uh, the ground is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Yarek. Uh, thank you for the invitation also. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yesterday evening, I, I have a special vodka-only dinner, which was an experience for me. <laughs> uh, okay, so today we'll speak about the mixture of uh, old things and new things. Uh, so the new, old things will be the experiment we done more than 40 years ago now uh, in Institute Optic about uh, experimental tests of best inequalities. And then the future direction will involve both uh, experiments, current experiments we are doing in our lab, and also a little bit of philosophical issue, because you know all these things about uh, realism uh, involve some philosophical challenge. So uh, maybe you don't know where is Institute Optic, and actually it moved. So uh, initially uh, it was in this uh, building, old building, uh, in the 70s, 80s. This is where the experiment that I will describe first will be, uh, were done, in Orsay. And then we moved to another place in Palaiso in 2007. We got a new logo, new name. We are graduate school now, to be fancy. Uh, and this is a place where the lab is now, uh, in, uh, which is in Palaiso. And both Orsay and Palaiso are not far from Paris. OK, so I will speak about quantum physics. So uh, as you know, quantum mechanics was elaborated at the end of the 20s. Uh, actually, next year, it will be 100 years and a birthday or anniversary of the creation of quantum mechanics by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, etc. So I like to say to my students, it's a good candidate to the title of greatest intellectual adventure of the 20th century, uh, greater than uh, relativity or psychoanalysis, for instance. It's uh, really astonishing. Uh, it is as a basis of what uh, our understanding of the world around us, uh, stability and structure of matter, light, interaction. You know that classically, uh, atoms are unstable. The electron rotating around the nucleus should radiate and fall on the nucleus, so everything should collapse. So we are here thanks to quantum mechanics. Uh, it's a perfectly coherent formalism. Huge success, incredible number of applications, transistor, electronics, etc., telecommunication. But there is a bus, uh, it keeps a mysterious character. Almost uh, 100 years after its foundations, uh, there are still mysteries around uh, because it's a non deterministic theory in a special sense. It's a non local theory in a special sense also. Uh, there is no simple correspondence between the macroscopic world and the microscopic world, the Schrodinger cat business. You probably heard about that. So, all this is, uh, you know, 
creates a tension uh, which have been uh, existing over the years and which is uh, still there. So the maybe more best known example of this tension is the famous uh, einstein bohr debate in 1935. Uh, so Einstein claims that quantum mechanics is incomplete, that is, uh, it hides some information from us. Uh, I, I will explain that in more detail later. Uh, so the, just the uh, same year, 35, Bohr wrote this paper with uh, another paper with the same title, telling that uh, actually quantum mechanics is complete, and this uh, debate uh, has been lasting for a very long time. So uh, at this time and until recently, uh, this was actually not a very popular debate because quantum mechanics was so successful. Uh, it allowed us to understand nature, properties of matter, as I said, new concepts, transistor, laser. And in this debate, there was no disagreement uh, on the validity of quantum prediction. It's more like a nature of reality debate, let's say. So it was considered as philosophical. But this changed in uh, 1964 when uh, Bell, uh, John Bell, came with a theorem, very famous. Uh, and then it took time to understand what was Bell saying. But uh, finally, uh, it turned out to be a sort of a very special situation where a philosophical debate could be translated into mathematical terms and then into experiments. So maybe you all know Bell's inequalities, I don't know, but I will make a one slide <laughs> summary of Bell's theorem. Uh, so Bell's theorem is basically uh, looking at uh, correlated particles. So there is a source which emits pa particles, uh, new one, new two, which goes to what is called a polarizer. So uh, the, there is an orientation to be chosen, A, and then the measurement can give two results, up or down, so plus one or minus one. So this is the same thing uh, for new, new, new B with orientation B. And uh, the purpose of the experiment is to look at the correlation between the two results. So correlation means when there is plus, there is plus, and when there is minus, minus. So the fact that there is correlation is not surprising at all. You just like look at twins, for instance. Twins have both blue eyes or both dark eyes because they have the same genes. So they have the same parents and then the same genes. So since my two photons come from the same source, a given pair of photons is expecting to have correlated properties. So it's not surprising at all to have correlation in such an experiment. So this is why uh, Bell did. And so he introduced uh, some uh, parameters called lambda, uh, which are called the local supplementary parameters uh, in the spirit of Einstein ID. So uh, what Einstein was telling was that this lambda is not defined by quantum mechanics. So it's sort of hidden. So quantum mechanics should be incomplete. So you, you can look at these lambda parameters as some sort of genes of the photons. Uh, and then given the lambda and given the measurement A, you can get the result plus or minus one. Same thing on the other side. And the lambda are random. They are fluctuating from one pair to the other. Uh, and there is a distribution which is positive and normalized. So it sounds very, very simple uh, hypothesis. Almost nothing, basically. You just uh, assume sort of common properties uh, which are carried by each pair of photons. And then Bell showed that you, if you look at what is called the correlation function, so it's uh, uh, A and B are random variables from one pair to the other, you just make the average over lambda of the product AB, which is a correlation or covariance. Uh, this you call it A, it depends on A and B. And then the surprising thing is that this quantity S, which is defined like that, has to be between plus two and minus two, just from this hypothesis. So you see these four quantities, which are between plus one and minus one, so it should be between plus four and minus four, but actually it's bounded to be between plus two and minus two. So this is Bell's inequalities. So it sounds almost nothing. It, it was very you know, smart to, to find, because the demonstration is two lines of calculation. I will not show it, but you find it easily in books. And so the big trouble is that this very simple inequality and very natural inequality is in contradiction with quantum mechanics uh, because quantum mechanics for an entangled pair of photons, like I started at the beginning here, predicts a maximum value of S for some choice of A and B, uh, which is two square root of two, which is larger than two. And so the big thing is that you see uh, it's sort of a debate about the nature of reality, which is turned into a mathematical inequality. And you can measure that. It's, uh, you, this experiment is feasible. Uh, so let's do it. <laughs> and so it was done. It was started in the 70s uh, in, in the US, especially with a special role of uh, John Clauser here. 
So there were conflicting results, and then there was a trend in favor of quantum mechanics, but uh, okay, this was really a uh, you know, difficult experiment and a little bit controversial at that time. So Alain Aspect started the experiment in the 70s at Institut Optique uh, with a much better source of photons. That is, if you have many, many photons, it's easier to do the measurement and also a test of quantum non-locality. Uh, I will give more details uh, later. So this was the experiment. This is where I started as a scientist in uh, 1980. I was still a student, uh, maybe like some of you. Uh, so this is a source emitting a pairs of photons. So he, just in this entangled state that we need to look for correlation. So the photons were emitted by calcium atoms. So we were exciting these atoms to the upper level of a cascade. And then the new one and new two were emitting in this entangled state. So the source was in this uh, vacuum chamber here. Uh, you need two lasers, so this is a rhodamine 6G dye laser, and this is a krypton ion laser, so you get up there, and then the two photons are emitted with a very small delay, and you can uh, count them uh, in coincidence. So there are many photons emitted, so it's a nice uh, way. So the photons go in this big pipe, so there is a you know, big plastic pipe uh, which sends the photon, green photon far away, and a big blue pipe for the other photons. Uh, and so with this uh, setup, we did uh, three experiments, uh, first with one-way polarizer as the previous ones, and then uh, you, so I will give more details on these experiments. So this is the first experiment that we need. So again, the, the setup, the source of photons, the big pipe, and then the photons were said, uh, you need polarizers. So polarizer, you know, a photon can give two results uh, along the axis of the polarizer or perpendicular. So these were pile of plates polarizers. So there are many plates. So this thing is big like that. You can see it in the museum of our lab now. Uh, so the polarization in the plane of the screen is transmitted with high efficiency, whereas the other polarization, the little arrows here, is lost somewhere. So the good polarization transmitted, the wrong polarization is lost somewhere. So it was also already used by uh, John Clauser in 72. So this one is, was in 81. Uh, and so uh, we did again the experiment and we got a very fast and very large uh, violation of Bell's inequalities. So it was sort of a repetition. So we wanted to improve on that. So we had a lot of discussion. So, well, maybe you recognize me <laughs> without the birth. <laughs> And the guy with the moustache is Alain Aspect, with his famous moustache. Uh, okay, so we, drew, we got a lot of coffee, uh, as you can see also. And then uh, Alain, uh, some weekend, went to Amsterdam with a big bag. So, you know, going to in the 70s to Amsterdam with a big bag was a little bit suspect about what you could bring back. But actually, what he brought back were these uh, marvelous things, which are polarizer cubes. So these are glass cubes with a coating uh, so that one photon is transmitted and the other photon is reflected. It's like compressing our big device in a single glass cube. So which means that the second photon is not lost somewhere, it's just deviated. So uh, it's very nice because we can do now a full experiment where uh, one photon is transmitted plus one and the second is reflected. We can count all coincidences between all photons and we can directly measure in a single shot the famous uh, E of A and B. So this was a very nice experiment with a lot of photons. Uh, and so, ah yes, and this polarizer, uh, so the, the little glass stuff uh, is inside a box, which is here, and these are polar, uh, photomultipliers. The big thing was like, uh, you know, 30, kilo, 30 kilograms, not easy to round, to turn, but okay, By we did it. Sorry? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. So it was not enough because our big was beam. Sorry, our beam was big, and so you need a wide aperture. So it was very difficult to get a birefringent crystal that size. Uh, whether with this polarizer, uh, it was quite feasible. And so we had to manage these big beams. This is why we use these polarizers. They are very usual now, but at that time, it was the very first multi dielectric polarizers uh, which were realized. And so the result was, uh, uh, okay, so you see the theoretical prediction was 2.7, we got almost 2.7, uh, and Bell's inequalities were violated by 40 standard deviations, which is a sort of a super large violation with super good agreement with quantum mechanics. But still, Alain was not happy because uh, there is this locality issue. So there is an hypothesis in Bell's inequalities, that is when you measure A on one side, it really depends on the orientation A, obviously, but it does not depend on B on the other side. And same thing, B does not depend on A, and the way the photons are emitted does not depend on the A and B, which is the direction you want to measure. 
So uh, inbuilt inequality is an assumption. But uh, Alain has D was to make it a consequence of relativistic causality. So the idea was that if you are able to change the orientation fast enough so that there is no information which can travel back between your choice and the source and the other polarizer, then relativistic causality enforces the fact that this uh, B and uh, this uh, dashed uh, uh, B here or A here are not here because there is simply no, no time to propagate. So then you, you have this huge polarizer, you would like to move them extremely fast, which is impossible. But again, the idea was to use switches. So if you are here a fast switch, which is able to orient the photons either to A or A primes on one side, B or B prime on the other one, very quickly, uh, faster than the travel time of the light. The travel time of the light is short, obviously. So you have to switch very quickly. Uh, then you could do something uh, which is uh, enforcing this hypothesis. So this is what we did. So the, this is a switch. So the switch is here. So actually it's about that size. It's a little tank which is filled with water and inside there is a standing wave. There are transducers and you make a standing wave. So when there is, the, it's oscillating, when there is no standing wave, the photon goes straight. Uh, and when there is a standing wave, there is diffraction by a thick grating and then the light is deviated. So every uh, 10 nanoseconds, uh, there is a switch between uh, that and that. And now since the travel time is about 40 nanoseconds, you switch just fast enough uh, to sort of uh, prevent uh, any kind of uh, causal uh, communication. So this was the idea. So this is a switch, this is a grating, and this is a device with uh, two outputs here uh, to two uh, polarizers in different orientations. It's not a random switch, yes. Uh, it's a, so what, what we checked is that the, it's not a fully random switch, and this is a so-called, okay, you anticipate my next slides, it's a so-called loophole. Uh, one would like really random switches, but it came afterwards. Okay, so this is a, basically the setup, and what happened is that, okay, it was more difficult to reduce signal. Uh, okay, we had to wait for photons for several hours, but, uh, you know, Alain is from uh, southwest of France, and you get, uh, when you wait, you have foie gras and sauterne, which are good things that I recommend to you if you don't know them. Uh, and the final result after uh, this uh, hours of waiting was that belt inequalities were, were violated by six standard deviation. Uh, the measurement were space-like separated, and so Einstein causality was enforced. So it was sort of a first check of really non-local, uh, in this sense, effect uh, in that kind of experiments. So it was nice. Uh, and so it uh, went up. So as I said, it's, uh, the, it was the first test of quantum non-locality uh, due to this relativistic separation. And then during the next year, there were uh, a lot of work to improve things. So one improvement was that, as you said, the switch were not really random. Uh, another point was that many photons were actually lost. That is, uh, the fraction of detecting photon was like 10 minus 6 of the total number of emitted photons. So it's like if you make a poll for a vote uh, with a very small sample, so it's not good. You want to make the real vote, which is with the whole population, but then you will need to catch all the photons. So this is possible. This has been done uh, with uh, photons emitted by crystal, for instance, non-linear crystal. And so it took a lot of time to improve on all that. So new source of entangled pairs, separate closure of loopholes, uh, okay, etc. And finally, after a lot of effort, it happened that in 2015, uh, all the loopholes were simultaneously closed in the sense that the experiments were as close as possible to the hypothesis of Bell theorem. So uh, three experiments were done in 2015, one in Vienna. Uh, so if you know Vienna, this is the Hofburg, the Imperial Palace. And in the basement of this imperial palace, you have like a bunker with a very long corridor. <laughs> and this is, so it's a similar idea uh, as we did, but uh, with a, a much longer distance, uh, tens of meters, a fully random switch actually now, uh, very fast also. And it was a sort of a very nicely and also correlated photons, uh, very high detection efficiency, etc. Similar experiment was done in Boulder in Colorado in the US. Uh, so this is the same thing, there is an angle between the two beams, but the idea is the same. And this one was done in Delft, it's interesting because now the correlated things are not photons, they are spins. 
uh, spins in diamond, so there are some tricks. So you use photon to untangle the two spins, but the measurement is done on spins. So it's material object, it's not photons, but it's, uh, you get, can get untangled states for spins, same thing, uh, and you can also test Bell inequalities. So in all these experiments, Bell's inequalities were violated uh, in a good, very good agreement with quantum mechanics, with more or less good statistics depending on the experiment, but this was quite convincing. Okay, so uh, it was sort of uh, nice. And so Alain wrote a paper in 2015 uh, that is closing the door on Einstein and Bohr's quantum debate. So you see, uh, by closing the loophole at uh, two loopholes at once, uh, three experiments, tests of Bell's inequality, remove the last doubts uh, that we should renounce local realism, which is basically Bell's inequalities. Uh, they, should, uh, they also open the door to new quantum information technologies. So the, the conclusion is that this, the hypothesis, since Bell's inequalities are violated, it means that there is something wrong in Bell's hypothesis. So and they are summarized at local realism, typically. So everybody was happy about that. It was a big achievement. And the consequence of Bell's <laughs> good, big achievement is a big price. So basically, the three guys I named before, John Clauser, the pioneer, uh, Alain Aspe, who did the switches experiment, and uh, Anton Zaliger, who did the final ones, uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2022. So I was happy enough to go in Stockholm. <laughs> so if you can ever go to Stockholm, go. <laughs> it's really fantastic. So this is not the Nobel Prize winner. This is Alain <laughs> uh, and uh, Jean Dalibar, who is a co-author of this one here and, and me here. So you, you get nice, nice shoots and you meet the king and this is really fantastic. Okay, uh, so what else? So this was a sort of the award. Now uh, what Alan wrote is that this opens the way to quantum technologies. So you know that quantum mechanics is everywhere around us with laser, um, electronics, everything I have in, the, in my hand. But um, due to this entanglement thing, there is what Alan calls a second quantum revolution. Uh, that is when you, you really reach the level of single atom, single photon, etc. And then uh, there are new properties, uh, superposition, entanglement, and then it opens the way to new methods to manipulate uh, information. Uh, so there are many examples, uh, manipulating individual photons, individual qubits, etc. And uh, you probably know that uh, it opens the way to all this quantum technology business. So typically there are four domain in quantum technology, uh, that is uh, ultimate precision, quantum sensors, so a good example is atomic clocks, but there are ma many other kinds of micro sensors, uh, ultra sensitive sensors, uh, micro -man magnetometers, etc. Another thing, I will come back to that, is the idea of quantum simulations. There are many quantum problems where you cannot access the object, for instance, superconducting crystal. Now, but you can reproduce the same physics on a bigger system, which are still small, but which are single atoms, for instance, uh, and then it's much easier to manipulate. So you can simulate a quantum system using another quantum system. I think it's a very nice idea. Uh, quantum communication, so it's ensuring uh, security with quantum by using entanglement, cryptography, etc., single photon sources. So all these things are very well developed, and probably the most famous, and uh, sorry, well known everywhere is uh, quantum computing. Uh, that is, in principle, using this kind of uh, entangled thing, uh, register, qubits, uh, you can make a super calculator much faster than any cl classical one. So any of these topics is a huge topic with a lot of activities now. So I will give more details on this one uh, because it's something we did in our lab. <laughs> uh, so it started actually a long time ago in 2001. This is an experiment I did with some PhD students, um, which is basically uh, capturing single atoms. So now a single atom is very small. So how can you catch and move a single atom? So we did that with the cold atom techniques. So uh, this is what is called the magneto-optical trap. So there are some magnets and some coils, and you can get cold atoms here, uh, where there is my red dot. Now, this thing is a super microscope objective uh, where you can send a laser beam and make a super small spot uh, in the center of your little cloud of atoms. And uh, these very small spots will act as, as a potential well. That is, if there is an atom coming around, it will just fall in the well. Now, he may go, he may just keep the same energy like a bicycle and get out. 
So there is another beam which cools the atom, which means that when it enters the trap, uh, it's, uh, you remove its kinetic energy, so it is stuck at the bottom of the trap. And uh, since the cooling atom also emits light, it means that you can see the atom in the trap. So in principle, you see some atom in a very, very tiny trap. So we did this experiment, and what we found was something like that. That is a little red dot in the middle uh, here was blinking. And so, uh, so you have an upper level. This is a amount of fluorescence. You have an upper level, a lower level. And so we calculated the upper level, and the upper level is a fluorescence of a single atom. So it seems that in, in our very little trap, there is either zero or one atom. It cannot be more atoms. So it's fantastic. It's a sort of self-blocking uh, trap. So what's the trick? The trick is that we have atoms around, and so here you, you have an atom in the trap, and here actually it's a second atom which enters the traps. But then there is a collision and both atom jumps. So actually it's blinking between zero and one atom. Each new atom brings back to zero if there is already one atom, or brings back to one if there is zero atom. So it's a self-stabilizing uh, single atom source, and the atoms are in this type ball trap, which means that you can move it. You, you have really a single atom at your fingertip. Uh, we found that a little bit by chance. It was published by nature, in Nature very quickly, and so we were very happy about that. Now, uh, so it's a heralded single atom source. Then uh, when you have one atom, you want more, uh, and so you can put, uh, make a little bit of diffraction, uh, and then instead of one trap, you get several traps with atoms in each trap. What you, we demonstrated also is that since you have, uh, first we simplify the thing, so this, this, this was a pretty big thing with many lenses inside, but actually we realized that you can do it with a single aspheric lens, this little thing, and also we realize that you can move your atoms around. Uh, you can also make quantum superposition and move the atom around, keeping the quantum superposition. So it's really a moving qubit. So this was done, you see, in uh, almost uh, 20 years ago already. Uh, but it worked, it's sort of a promising device. Then something else happened, uh, which is a read -build blockade. So this is also a very nice idea by this uh, famous uh, theoretician which is that uh, our two atoms are typically a few microns apart. So two atoms in two traps a few microns apart don't interact. But uh, you may excite the atoms to uh, what is called Rydberg state, which are very highly excited level. And when both atoms are in Rydberg states, they interact very strongly. And so it means that the energy level of the pair ato of atom is moved as a function of distance. And when they are close enough, the two atoms, like three microns away, then it's so shifted that you cannot excite the uh, atom pair anymore, uh, just to see it a little bit more precisely. So you can excite one atom here. So if you excite one atom, you go, so GG is ground ground. This is uh, both excited. This is one excited, one ground. So you go to this level, but this one is forbidden because the energy level is moved out. So then you can excite one atom, but you cannot excite two. So this is what is called Rydberg blockade. Mm -hmm. So now what do you excite? You, call, you excite GR or RG, one of the two atoms. But which, which one? You don't know which one. But you more than don't know. It's a quantum don't know. And what is a quantum don't know? I want to hear it. <laughs> you don't know what is a quantum don't know? Superposition. It's a superposition, exactly. So we directly create a superposition of the pairs of atoms. So it's probably the simplest way. Well, it's a big experiment, but once you have it, you just excite and it goes to a, an entangled state. So uh, because uh, it's a superposition, but it's also an entangled set. So you don't know which set. It's very similar to my entangled set of two photons, but now it's an entangled set of two atoms, either this or that, and you don't know which one, and it's a superposition. So if you can do that, you can do also sort of computing, whatever, with, with, with a pair of atoms. Uh, so we publish that. So it's entanglement of two individual neutral atoms using Rydberg blockade. So now, not only we have single atoms, but we have a way to deterministically couple these pairs of atoms. Yeah, so depending on the distance, so if we have several atoms, we can make them interact on demand because they interact only when they are excited to the upper level. If there is not this green arrow laser, they just say kindly in the ground set. 
So it's a deterministic entangled, entangling interaction, uh, exactly what you need for quantum computer, etc. So, uh, well, it went on. So, um, okay, two, one atom, two atoms are not enough. So, uh, few, lay, few years later, the idea was to, to make sort of, to use a SLM, which is spatial light modulator. So you make a sort of a sophisticated grating and the diffraction function of this sophisticated grating is an area of trap. So you can do all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, so this is a grating and then the diffraction function, which is what you get uh, in the vacuum chamber, is four spots. And then you can fill these four spots with atom. But you can also make nine spots, you can make circle, you can make whatever you want. Uh, the distance is always between around a few microns between two, two different atoms. But you think that you can make really uh, arrays of atoms uh, that you and you can see and address uh, individual atoms and also make them interact, as I will show uh, later. So this was, you know, time is passing. This was only 10 years ago. <laughs> OK, so next step. Uh, so if you do that, what you get is something like that, because as I said, the probability to fill one trap is one half. So basically, you have a, something like that, which is that half of the traps are filled with a red dot and the other one are black because there is no atom. What you would like on the other hand is uh, all traps filled. So what you would like is to get all the atoms, maybe in a little corner, but without holes. Uh, and then this is a full quantum register that you can use for calculation. So what you would like to do is, sorry, <laughs> is to go <coughs> from here to there. And it took us a lot of time to understand how to do that. But finally, it worked, and it's actually very simple. Uh, when you have your area, you can add a second beam. And then uh, what you can do is simply catch one atom and move it to a, to a trap. So you see, it's what you see here. With another movable beam, you catch one atom. You increase the depth of the trap by increasing the light intensity. So you catch the atom, then the atom can move. Then you go to another trap, decrease the intensity, and just leave it in another trap. So it's really one atom at your fingertip that you can move as you wish. And what is fantastic is that a single move from one trap to another takes one millisecond. It's really fast because the distance is so small. So then you can move hundreds of atoms very quickly. So, OK, <laughs> it took time to get that. So all these things are stuff. But when you get the ID, it can be really nice. So it works this way. So you, have, you load your atoms. You take an image. You turn off the cooling light so that the atoms are in the dark. But you know where they are. Then you can move them around uh, and then check that you have fit the trap. Uh, it's very important that when you move the atoms, there is no cooling light. So you, no cooling light means also that you don't see the atoms. You move them in the, in the dark. But uh, where, if they are in the dark, they just stay in the trap unless you move them uh, with the tweezer. And so in order to assemble, uh, to make a little array with uh, 100 atoms, it takes uh, less than one second because you, uh, <laughs> it's pre-programmed and it works really well. Uh, OK, so these are some uh, examples. So you, you see, this is the initial picture. You take a picture. Uh, and when you know the picture, you know how to arrange. You program the thing. And then you get this, that, or uh, whatever you want. So this is here fully arrays of 50 atoms. Uh, now, uh, recent progress last year is 300 atoms. Now they have about 1,000 uh, fully deterministically loaded uh, atoms array. So this is really impressive. Uh, and so it's a, it's a nice system to implement synthetic quantum mechanics, all kind of stuff. Uh, so this, uh, you see, time is progressing. Now we are in uh, 2016. Uh, and uh, OK, so it works so well that actually it was copied in many places. <laughs> so everybody is doing that now all over the world, uh, especially in the US, but not only. OK, so what else? So you see, it's a little bit of an example. Also, this is an array with uh, about 200 atoms. Uh, just to show that uh, you can do whatever you want uh, with this uh, special light modulator. The experiment by... I, I'm not doing this experiment anymore. I, I just gave the, the lab to this person, Anton Rues, who is now leading the group. So, well, you can have some fun also. Do you re recognize her? <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> She's in Paris. Uh, and... Uh, sorry, here. Do you recognize him? 
Sorry? The guy with the moustache. Yes, the guy with the moustache. <laughs> yes, it's Alain. <laughs> Just for the fun. Uh, OK. OK, so what can you do with that? So uh, you have this array of atoms, but as I said, uh, if you just make the array, the atoms don't interact. So you want them to interact, but you just have to excite two atoms to redox states, and then they will interact. And it's a programmab programmable uh, excitation, because you can decide uh, which atoms you excite. So if they are too far away, they will not interact, as I showed at the beginning. The Rydberg blockade requires them to be close enough, but not next site. It can be a few sites away, and they can still interact. And then you have sort of a programmable uh, gates between atoms, and each atom uh, behaves like a little quantum magnet. Uh, and so you can entangle them uh, and make sort of... So this is really uh, getting close to the idea of uh, quantum simulations. So you can check magnetism effect, you can make transport, for instance, you can make a light of atom, a line of atoms and see how the excitation moves from one atom to the other to study superconductivity. So it's a, it's a fancy thing which is called uh, yes, artificial quantum matter. Uh, that you can, you can program your atom arrays to reproduce effects which occur in solid state physics. For instance, in solid state physics, the distance between atoms is angstrom, so you don't have direct access. Here, it's micron, so you can see uh, the arrays. So this is quite nice and working quite well. So this is basically an implementation of this idea of quantum simulation, uh, which was proposed by Feynman. Uh, for strongly correlated quantum matter. Uh, and I think it's a major possible outcome of all these quantum technologies because you are really in a new, in a new country because you have access to these single atoms. You can entangle them on demand, uh, make them interact on demand. So it, it opens really a lot of uh, perspective. So it's so nice that they create a company. <laughs> I'm not in the, so the company's founder were Alain. Uh, so Georges Raymond here is the boss of the company, but actually he was my PhD student on the first single atom trap in 2001. Now he's a big boss. <laughs> Time is going again. Antoine Bouès, who is a current leader and collaborator. Uh, Christophe Jurzac here he, he is a banker. He's the guy who put the money in the, in the stuff. So you see, that this, was a, this is our standard cold atom lab looks. And now this is what they have done in the company because they, they want to sell that. So and they have to package it in a thing we, way which can be transported, which is reliable, which work without a PhD student next to it or two PhD students next to it. Uh, and they are doing a lot of things uh, for applications. So you can try it. Basically, now you go to the standard you know, business or hype. Yarek says hype <laughs> of quantum computing. That is, you want to sell these ideas to bankers, to uh, companies, because you, uh, basically you can, uh, a big uh, outcome of this kind of thing is optimization problems. For instance, if you look for a ground set of an atom, it may be a molecule, and the molecule may be tricky. But you can also match, for instance, uh, an electrical network uh, on your array of atoms and, and look for an optimization problem. So this is why it is interesting. So this was done, one of these papers, you know, is called financial risk management. It was done with a bank. And this one was done by, with ODF, which is uh, the big electricity uh, French company. And uh, OK, also it works super well. <laughs> so there, there, are, there are now maybe around 200 people in this uh, company, and they have also hundreds of millions. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of competition. Also, this QRA uh, company also was created in Boston by uh, Michel Lukin, who is a sort of a super guy in the area. Uh, uh, I think it's very Business was a 
John Bell. Possibility. Uh, uh, as for the coalition, well, that. To do a little bit of option and like to say that prediction regarding the future Or to speak about the but uh, as I said, if The context is simply you see the big difference is that. is uh, specific. It's a system we see in a con
Actually, the object is not the system, you, you must define Well, you get some kind of con uh, also it can server itself is, is outside. So Uh, it creates a strong tension with uh, relativity, relativistic causality because even if it is hidden, you have some problem with relativity. You don't see it, but it should be there. So, okay, so I don't like it very much. I told that to Yarek. <laughs> uh, so, other option uh, the quantities A and B are not independent variables. So, there is violation of free choice, etc. Uh, so, some people like it. For instance, uh, Gerhard Tuff, for Nobel Prize, uh, is advocate of this super determinism. Uh, everything is decided in advance. It's a little bit, well, shaky. Uh, okay, no free will, uh, I don't like that. So, okay, I prefer also to avoid it. And the, the third one, which is the last one, which is a shut up and calculate, actually it's more subtle. Uh, so if you use this uh, uh, contextual objectivity, that is a system within a context, actually it works pretty well. Uh, you need randomness and contextuality, and this is by far the version I prefer. It's also maybe the closest one to standard uh, quantum mechanics. But then Psi is not complete indeed, because Psi has to be completed by specifying the measurement context. So you see the whole attempt of hidden variable was to complete Psi from below, but completing Psi from below does not work. So let's complete Psi from above by specifying object. Uh, and then, well, it's fine. It's not in textbook. I don't know exactly why it's not in textbook, but I find it very natural given uh, what quantum mechanics uh, tells us. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to the end. So quantum entanglement, okay, is now experimentally validated, testing belt inequalities. It's definitely non-classical. So then uh, you you get a new, lot of new physical ideas, uh, new stuff. By uh, You can also use it uh, for application, which is very fashionable. Uh, as Yarek told, if you want money, you should go here. <laughs> uh, but there is a third pillar, which is basically that philosophical ideas about the nature of physical reality, ontology, what is, what is, uh, what is, uh, what is existing. Uh, I think it's, it's very intellectually stimulating, and we should not forget about it. Uh, even if, uh, okay, the, as I said, th this one is easy to fund, this one is half easy to fund, this one is extremely difficult to fund, but okay, you can, as I say, you can think about it on weekends when there is nothing on the TV. Okay, uh, and then just to conclude, uh, okay, uh, many of these ideas were inspired by Anna. So thank you and bravo, Anna, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this fascinating talk and, uh, uh, and the review from uh, um, optical experiments to philosophical issues. Thank you very much, Philippe. So now let's open the discussion and we have the first
Professor Zanjewski. Referring to this fantastic experiment with arrays of neutral atoms, obviously they are competing with the trapped ions yes. experiments. Could you just, in, in two or three sentences, uh, well, compare them, tell uh, what is good yeah. about atoms, what's good about ions? Uh, uh, well, there are various, the, something which is obviously good for atoms is that you get immediately 2D arrays. And so you have a much larger connectivity uh, than in uh, typically traps so far are one line. So there is a lot of effort to make 2D traps now. I don't think they work that well. Where, whether for atoms, you can make line if you want, obviously, but you get very easily this 2D structure. You can even get 3D structures. They make a little Eiffel towers with single atoms. Um, programming interaction in 3D structure is difficult, but programming in, in, uh, interaction in 2D structures is, is nice. Also, um, in, in uh, ions, you uh, only have the Coulomb interaction, which is sort of fixed. Uh, here, with the Rydberg interaction, you can program it. So you can make it l large range, short range. You can change this blockade sphere, the area of influence of one atom. So I think the, let's say, amount of possibilities opened by atomic arrays is larger. Also, now there are arrays with 1,000 atoms. I, I don't think they have uh, this with ions so far. So, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm promoting atoms. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> which is sort of natural. Yes. Okay, um, more questions? Rafa. So, turning to this uh, philosophical stuff. But, um, so, okay, I like your idea as a kind of a recipe how to think but on the other hand what you define as a context uh, is in fact setting up measurement devices and stuff and and i mean like persistent philosopher would say okay but these are also physical objects which we describe as quantum so we need context for this context and, ah, yes, yes. and so on and then you you end up with this observer in the end no 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 no, no. <laughs> and is, so so that's yeah. i would say just deviating the problem again just keeping uh, yeah, yes. it yes so i, the I first answer stage. that we, we answer that uh, there is no super context, which is basically the thing, uh, which when you are at the context level, you are actually at the classical level and you don't need a context for the context. Uh, so why is it so? Uh, so I skip, if you look at the last paper, the basic reason is that the context is unbounded. Uh, and so once you are unbounded, you are unbounded. Uh, and so you cannot, you know, otherwise you go, you run into this Wigner type uh, experiments where you turn a system in a context. So it's sort of completely forbidden by our approach. We, we absolutely accept this Eisenberg cut and then we try to explain it afterwards. And in order to explain it, we, we use this operator algebra techniques, uh, which are a little bit tricky mathematically. I discussed that with Yarek. But at least at the infinity limit, it works pretty well. And it shows that if you, if you go to the limit of an countable infinity of subsystems, actually the Hilbert space blows up. It was already demonstrated by von Neumann. And then you get sectors, and these sectors look very much like classical world. But you have to go to infinity. But it's mathematical infinity. So you have to play a little bit with a relation that is, can we use infinite mathematics to describe finite physics? I would say yes, but nobody, not everybody accepts that. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Well, I, I had a lot of slides on that. Uh, I don't know if I can show you more on that. Blah, 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 blah. What is this thing? No, these are other things. No, this will go too far. Uh, I cannot tell much more, <laughs> but if you are interested, please have a look at the last paper, <laughs> the paper at the bottom of the list. We, we discuss that in detail. But yes, we, we do acknowledge the cut, but we, we want to not to, it's not an email. You, you see, uh, um, there is a very famous statement by uh, Lando, which is at the beginning of uh, Lando Lifshitz's book. Maybe you know it, uh, which is at uh, Quantum mechanics is a very strong theory in the sense that uh, it, uh, it sort of recovers classical physics uh, at its limit, but it needs these limits for its own formulation. 
So uh, from the beginning, we are stuck because if we don't have classical physics, we cannot formulate quantum physics. So this is why I tell we need both at the same time. Quantum physics is a theory of subsystems. And if you extend this subsystem to infinity, you, you close the loop and recover uh, the context, which is what you need to start with. Well, this is our little construction. <laughs> Okay, more more questions, Oliver. Thanks. Uh, so I was kind of interested in in what you were just talking about. So um, if you take this construction, but don't take the limit right to infinity, but just have a very large number of subsystems, is it the case that like um, your observers and your contexts are still quantum? Yeah, oh, well, we spent the whole morning discussing that with Yarek. Okay. <laughs> uh, like, is this just like many worlds uh, like, in disguise? You, you have to, to, to be a little bit specific. That is, um, this kind of infinite limit, the goal is to explain um, idealized quantum mechanics where you have perfectly isolated systems, for instance. These systems are embedded in a context, but they are completely isolated from the context. Now, uh, and uh, uh, Un unless you do a measurement. A measurement is basically recoupling the system and the context. So you have sort of a separated uh, regime, uh, the isolated regime, purely isolated regime, where you recover the context as the infinite limit, and uh, the measurement where everything is mixed up and you change the context and the result. Uh, so it looks fine, but it's, it's idealization. In practice, you have to manage the boundary. And to manage the boundary, well, we, we have tricks that, that are already known around the decoherence theory and various things. But in our view, decoherence theory is never closed because you, you don't know where to stop. You have to trace out some stuff, but you don't know which stuff you have to trace out. It's mathematically a little bit unstable. Uh, and uh, the, the, the very fact that the Hilbert space is unstable at infinity, it self-destroys. Uh, and von Neumann told that, uh, it's a hint that you, you may use that. Uh, but then in practice, you will have to manage the fact that the, the system is never completely isolated, and then you can do, there are many methods now to, with open quantum system, etc. So it's not contradictory with open quantum system, but we, we want to a closed loop. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you have the closed loop, uh, ideal, idealized closed loop, uh, you can make approximation, uh, including for uh, if you want to see, uh, for instance, what is the decoherence time or decoherence size of your experiment, uh, you can do approximate calculation, and people know how to do that. Yes, thanks. Yes. Uh, okay, more questions? Sometimes I, I tell, so, you know, this kind of approach is not a theory of everything, it's a theory of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so are there, are there more questions maybe? I, if not, then maybe I will ask, but I will not go into the philosophy. We, we had uh, quite a long talk before, before your seminar. So I wanted to ask about the uh, uh, quantum uh, synthetic matter. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, just to give a rough idea, what kind, of, uh, uh, what kind of systems can you simulate, let's say, with an um, array of uh, 300 atoms? Yes, so this is this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so magnetism, transport, superconductivity. Uh, so you, you can, uh, it's a very, very active subject. So there are supergroups, our, our group in Institute Optique led by Antoine Brouez. There is also the group of Michel Lukin in ha Harvard and now many others. So you, since you, you, you see this kind of thing is for instance a molecule, let's say to be popular, a chlorophyll, which uh, basically uh, stores energy from the sun, etc. cetera. Uh, you, you can model that by hopping in, in an atom chain, mm -hmm. and they did it. And then the, the standard thing also are the big Hamiltonian, uh, that is the bose obard fermi obard all these things. There are tricks also, uh, all these things are bosons, but there are tricks now to rematch two fermions. Uh, specialist on that is uh, Emmanuel Bloch in, in uh, Munich. 
so he's doing it's not exactly he is also using the same arrays it's not kind of the same kind of arrays but uh, also the single neutral atoms uh, there is also a group in Paris uh, um, Christophe Salomon uh, who is using real fermions you, you have fermionic uh, isotope of lithium for instance uh, that you can cool to so there is no Bose, con Bose and Schein condensation but still you can make very cool fermion uh, and so yes so there is really a, a full country that is many many things to uh, because and, uh, you have access to single atoms and you can play with them so well <laughs> it's uh, attractive for experimentalists and and, uh, how long uh, what are the, the the some sort of coherence times how how long can you keep the synthetic matter uh well it depends you you, you can keep it long enough to make measurement that is well, you you basically prepare your all the thing in the ground set you excite to read block set you make a, a control uh, excitation for instance and then uh, you you make a picture so the typical result of an experiment is that initially you have a completely filled array but then for you may end up in uh, upper set or lower set of your qubits or whatever you take a picture you see what is missing and then you do that many many times and you do the statistics this is how a typical experiment looks yeah. like. But is it like uh, seconds? Because uh, ah, no, well, or, or, or that a fraction is, of a second? Or? Uh, the, the time you can take the, the array without interaction is seconds, even minutes if you cool a little bit. Okay. But now the, the duration of the Rydberg interaction is uh, some microseconds typically. Yeah, but, 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 but I meant that this, this time that the array can stay in a oh, stable yeah, yeah, state. Yeah, so yeah. this is even minutes. Uh, okay. uh, it oh, depends. It's Basically, it's limited by the quality of the vacuum. Mm -hmm. so so if you use standard vacuum 10 minus 10 it's um, seconds 10 seconds now if you if you cool uh, just with uh, standard helium 4 cryostar uh, it can go to minutes yes so there's, there's, if you want hundreds of atoms uh, you have to cool to avoid background gas uh, hitting your, your atoms mm -hmm. but for instance they, they have a uh, orange areas I, I saw it with uh, 300 atoms in a, in a cooled uh, environment cold environment and it, then it stays for minutes. Fascinating. So you can synthesize your own matter and yeah, keep it but, for but, okay. minutes even. In that case, nothing happened. They are just standing there. Uh, so what is interesting is to program the interaction. And then, yeah. then the thing is pretty fast. And then once you did it, you can redo, refill, and etc. Fascinating. And, yes. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions, Victor? <clears throat> I'm sorry, maybe this is a naive question, but after all, I still want to understand, I want to ask you to explain the difference between this interpretation of a uh, quantum object within textuality and just um, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Well, is there a various way to tell it? Uh, so if you want a filiation, so what are our father? What is our closest father? So clearly our closest father will be Niels Bohr. Okay? But now if you look at Niels Bohr, the trouble is that he, he told many things which are a little bit chaotic. Uh, he tell, depending on what you read, depending on the year, he, he makes some statements which are almost uh, contradictory. Also, he insisted a lot of complementarity. Uh, you, I never spoke about complementarity. Uh, so, in, in practical terms, clearly, you, you could see uh, like uh, an improved version of Copenhagen given uh, everything we know now, which is quite different from uh, Bohr, what Bohr and company were knowing uh, in their time. So, they were doing a lot of things which was, uh, so many arguments were very shaky, uh, and I think we can do better. But still, if I want basically a joint, a classical quantum distribution due to this Landau statement you, you need classical to specify just to formulate quantum we end up with a picture which is uh, close to Copenhagen as you say but for instance a big criticism of Copenhagen was that it's uh, anti-realist or subjectivist or whatever I completely disagree with that there is nothing anti-realist or subjectivist in what I say I say it's a contextual but it's contextual because it's quantized uh, so quantum mechanics has a contextual uh, ingredient, which does not mean that you create it in your brain. It's still physics uh, in, in the sense of physical realism that I defined at the beginning. 
Mm. <laughs> Does that okay. answer your question? Oh. Partly. <laughs> so it's probably... Uh, we still have one year to decide before the 100th <laughs> year anniversary. <laughs> it's probably a subject for a much longer discussion. Uh, we finish here. Uh, let's thank Philip again for a fantastic talk. Thank you very much, Philip. <laughs>